Hello again. Uh, today we're going to talk about propagation effects. This is the third lecture in the Introduction to Radar Systems course and of course this is part one of that lecture. Now today's lecture as I said is going to focus on propagation effects. That is to say the effects of the, uh, mic of the microwaves as they pass from the antenna out to the target, <clears throat> excuse me, where they are reflected and back. So we're talking about propagation normally through the atmosphere. Many different classes of radar uh, have been built, radars that operate from the ground, sea-based radars, airborne radars, and all of them propagate their radar beams through the Earth's atmosphere or near the Earth's atmosphere. Some of them propagate down low within the atmosphere, some of them propagate upward to the very sparse areas of the atmosphere, but they all propagate through it. This medium, as was on the last view graph, we call it the soup. It's everything between the target and the radar. And this um, lecture will focus on what happens to the radar beam? Now there are really four things that happen to the radar beam, four propagation effects that make a difference in terms of the radar's performance. First of all is attenuation through the atmosphere. The microwave electromagnetic radiation will interact with the atmosphere, some of the energy will scatter and will be lost in this scattering process. And so the beam will be weaker in power when it hits the target and then when it comes back. So the, the beam in, its, in and of itself is going to be weaker a, a little bit over time as it passes through the atmosphere. Secondly, that beam will interact if it's a radar close to the surface some of the energy if it will go out straight to the target, but some of the energy in the lower reaches of the beam, the lower angular portions, will reflect down onto the Earth's surface, bounce back up, and what you'll have interacting with the target, excuse me, is a mixture of that direct path and what we call the multipath. And we'll discuss that issue. Okay. Then there are electromagnetic effects that cause the microwaves to be able to pass over the horizon so that what would be for us the uh, horizon that what you would think you'd say gee there's a mountain there nothing can no nothing my eye can't see behind the mountain but waves can go behind that mountain that diffraction can take place and lastly we're going to talk about the bending of the beam in the atmosphere. Because the atmosphere is not homogeneous in, hi in height in terms of its density and pressure and temperature, those effects will cause the beam to bend so that you can see further in some cases than you normally would. And we'll go over the physics of what's going on in each of these uh, four different uh, effects. So the beam can be attenuated, reflected, and bent by the environment. Now what is in this soup? Okay, uh, The atmospheric parameters, they vary with altitude. Uh, if you've ever flown on an airplane, uh, it can be 60, 70 degrees at uh, sea level, and uh, if you go on a transatlantic jet, they tell you your speed and the temperature outside, and you look at it says minus 40 degrees or minus 50 degrees. Temperature gets less as you go higher. We all know people who go up on, say, Mount Everest bring oxygen with them because the pressure, the amount of air up there is much less. So we know that the, the density of air um, is much less, the pressure, it's, it's much, atmospheric pressure is much less as you go up in altitude. And also the water vapor content is also less. And these are three things uh, that affect what is known as the index of refraction, 
which is the electromagnetic property which determines how much and how a beam is uh, bent in the atmosphere. And then also the water vapor content, the fog content, and the rainfall rate if it's raining will affect how much the beam is scattered. With respect to the Earth's surface, um, that bouncing of the beam off the Earth's surface and reinteracting is going to depend, you could imagine quite readily, intuitively, whether the surface is land or sea. A very smooth, uh, calm sea would appear like a mirror, so you'd expect to get a very strong reflection. Whereas if the uh, ground were a forest, you'd expect all kinds of different reflections and, and, a, and a less strong reflection from the ground than you would. And then the Earth's curvature comes into play. Um, the, uh, the Earth is curved, so what you would expect to see if there was a flat Earth, I'll give you an example. If you were at a, you're at a, a hundred foot altitude and the Earth was flat, you know, 50 miles away, 100 miles away, if you had good binoculars, uh, you would look out, and if there was no atmosphere, you'd be able to see that person a hundred feet up if you were a hundred feet up, quite readily. But the Earth is curved and that person is behind the curved Earth. So Earth's curvature is going to play into this also. So let's go over one at a time what these four different effects are, come to a good physical understanding of what they are and see how they affect the radar's performance and propagation and how one might design a radar. First, let's look at atmospheric propagation. Uh, here I've plotted the, uh, the uh, attenuation in dBs per kilometer. Now, w what I want you to note is that um, this factor of 10 dB is an order of magnitude. I plotted it on a log scale, and that's the attenuation for each, app, for each kilometer of path length. So if the, per, if the uh, attenuation were 10 dB per kilometer and the radar had a range of 10 kilometers, that means there would be 100 dB of uh, attenuation, a huge attenuation. If we went down here uh, and we had uh, 10 kilometers away at 1 dB per kilometer, the signal would drop an entire order of magnitude. Up here it would drop 10 orders of magnitude. Ten zeros you'd see up there in, a, in just a 10 kilometer range. And it's you know about six and a half miles or so. And you can see when we build radars out to uh, hundreds of miles, this attenuation factor can be huge if you're dealing up here uh, this, or, but, but minuscule if you're dealing down here with a hundredth of a dB per, per kilometer um, uh, and in 10 miles it's only a tenth of a dB the signal would drop by a very 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 small amount. Now here we see uh, we've plotted that attenuation as a function of frequency and here I've noted the different frequency bands. Up here is in the millimeter wave region Notice in the curve that's plotted for the attenuation versus frequency, there are two big bumps. And they're sort of places you don't want to build a radar. What are they caused by? This first bump is caused by absorption of water vapor in the atmosphere. And this second one is caused by absorption of oxygen. There's another oxygen line way up higher, above 100 gigahertz. But the fact is, is that even though there are these bumps here, which give enormous increases uh, in, uh, in attenuation, the attenuation down where most radars are, are caused by the tails of these, dis of these two distributions for the water, the water and the oxygen um, absorption. So you can see that high frequencies up here at X and K band, K A and W band, I uh, put a little number on it, 95 gigahertz, 35, 16, 9 and a half or 10, 5 and a half, 3. Uh, well, at the, up in the upper half, at high frequencies, it's not well suited for low altitude surveillance where you'd be going.
I want, might want to note that I didn't say it earlier, this is atmospheric attenuation right at sea level. The actual attenuation that you'd get if you were pointing up at an angle where you'd be going partially through the lower, uh, the higher attenuation at sea level and partially much less attenuation as you go up in altitude uh, are, are different than this curve. And in radar handbooks and textbooks are curves where you could say, where are plotted, say, the attenuation as a function of frequency for a beam that's pointed upward at 1 degree, 2 degree, 3 degrees, 8 degrees. And they take into account the different attenuations for a standard atmosphere. And what I'm talking about also here is the average attenuation at sea level. The atmosphere varies uh, in its properties of temperature, pressure, humidity, and density, and all those, all those attributes which cause attenuation. It varies all over the, the, uh, the world. If you're in a rainforest uh, and, and there's no, not even any fog or raining, there'll be a natural more moisture in the air than if you were in the Sahara Desert when there's very little uh, moisture in the, in the air. Uh, if you were in a, uh, a, a, a hot desert where the temperature is higher at sea level than the Arctic where it's cooler at sea level, the attenuation would be different. And so there's a, 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 a geographical change that's, that's somewhat different. But the, the huge difference, the biggest difference you're going to see is that as the, the uh, things get rapidly cooler, the, pr the temperature goes down, or excuse me, the, the pressure of the uh, atmosphere, the density goes down as you go in altitude, and that's the most significant thing, influencing the index of refraction, which is the propagate. Now, if we go and we look and we see for a 50 kilometer radar, what the two-way attenuation is, um, we see that, that if you're at operating at a frequency, say, right at this level, uh, which would be up around 80, 85 gigahertz, you have 100 dB of attenuation. So, that, so you're going to end up with one slash uh, with 50 kilometers two-way. Uh, this is the total attenuation in dB. You're going to have one with 10 zeros of the one slash 10 zeros of the power left. Uh, it's one, it's a very small number. Point, oh, 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 I'm not quite sure if I got enough O's, one of the power left. Whereas if you're operating with, um, in this region down here, where, uh, say, you're near KU band, and you're operating uh, right here, um, at a tenth of a, of a dB per kilometer, and the two-way attenuation is um, 10 dB, so you have a tenth of the power left. So the difference between here and here is huge in terms of the attenuation for a 50 kilometer two-way path. So again, we note that high frequencies are not well suited for a low altitude uh, surveillance. Now let's look at the case where rain and fog uh, are in the atmosphere. They too will attenuate in addition to the normal atmosphere. If rain is present, there will be significant attenuation. And as I'm sure you probably just looked down for a moment, yep, at high frequencies, um, radar performance is heavily weather independent. So in other words, at high frequencies, you're going to get a lot of attenuation in rain. And at low frequencies, it's going to be much more reasonable. Okay? And so what it basically says when you look, um, if you want to design a radar that um, uh, is going to be short range uh, so that there's not a lot of path length, uh, well, I'll say it another way. Radars at, exp at uh, KU band and KA and W band tend to be shorter range radars.
or they operate above the atmosphere or where the atmosphere is is limited, like an airborne radar would operate there. Or you could operate radars in these frequency regimes, these of CS and uh, K-band, if you wanted to uh, see weather, if weather was your target of interest. And if not, you're going to you have to find a way to uh, add extra power to the system, because uh, give take an example here of. Uh, the total attenuation on a two-way path, you can just uh, go out and look at it and see that uh, uh, for really uh, medium level rain of four millimeters an hour, you're going to have uh, significant attenuation at X-band. Okay. Now let's look at reflection from the Earth's surface, that whole issue of reflection from the Earth's surface. But because, um, we're, as I mentioned, we're going to have the interaction of the direct line of sight path and a, and a path that bounces off the Earth, the interference between those two parts of the beam, uh, those two paths for the radar beam, is important. I'm just going to uh, reiterate the interference um, issues and basics of interference of electromagnetic waves that we talked about earlier. Now here we see um, wave one in yellow and wave two in I believe it's red, I'm colored blind, and wave three in blue, it's red green colored blind if I make a mistake in the lectures. Uh, and we see that we have two waves on the, the yellow and uh, the red on top of each other. And if we add them together, wave one and wave two, we notice that we have them set up so that they start, the, the phases start at exactly the same time uh, at the same phase, and they add constructively. And what we get is twice the amplitude, twice the amplitude at the peaks, and twice the amplitude at the valleys, at the troughs. And, so, and they're called constructively interfering. If we shifted these two waves by one half of a wavelength, right over here, we, we see an example of where we've done it, where the, the yellow and the red are out of phase by 180 degrees. They're exactly a half a wavelength apart. The positive part of wave two subtracts from the, uh, adds together and, and they subtract out with wave one. And here we have the positive part of wave one and adding with the negative part of wave two. And we end up with destructive interference essentially zero. Okay? So waves can interfere constructively if they're in phase and destructively if they're out of phase by pi over two. Uh, excuse me, by pi or 180 degrees. And so the resulting amplitude strength can uh, vary a factor of two. The radar voltage can range from zero to two uh, depending upon the level of constructive or interference or destructive interference. Now since the power is proportional to the voltage squared, the power will range from zero to four times the power. And since the interference operates on both the inbound and outbound trips, then we can get a difference of from zero to 16 times the power. 16 times the power. So that's significant, and 16 times the power is what it, what it, what it takes to double your range. So if you have a range of a radar with no interference, you can double the range if you have constructive interference, or it can go down to zero if it's destructive interference. Well, welcome back to the uh, Introduction to Radar Systems course. Uh, we're now working on the Propagation Effects lecture, and we're going to start part, uh, part two of that lecture. Okay, um, at the end of the last lecture, uh, we went over basic interference effects. Let me just uh, take it a step back further. 
Okay, here we are with the outline. Uh, we're discussing reflection from the Earth's surface. At the end of the last lecture, we discussed basic interference issues. We saw that two waves can constructively or destructively interfere, and this can result in quite different uh, relative amplitudes of the sum, depending on how the phases are, the relative phase of wave one and wave two. The voltages can range from zero to two. These voltages squared, which are the power, zero to four. And because the interference operates on both the incoming and outgoing wave, it can be a factor of 16. And now we'll move on to the first view graph of this part. We're going to take that concept of interference and look at the practical example of propagation from a radar to a target and back over a plain Earth. That's over a flat Earth. Now the reflection from the Earth's surface will result from the interference of the radar signal in, that goes directly out, hits the target, and comes back. And if the beam is sufficiently broad, as it would be in a low frequency beam, some of the radiation will go out at a slightly lower angle, will reflect off the Earth, go up, hit the target, and reflect back. And it's the interference of those two paths, the direct path and the multipath, that we're going to examine. Okay? Now, we notice we've got a reflection off the Earth. Uh, that's characterized by a surface reflection coefficient, which determines the relative amplitude of the reflected signal. Now that reflection depends on the surface of the Earth. Is it a very shiny uh, surface, like we'd say, that ocean is mirror smooth? Or it could be a very rough ocean. Or if it's land, is it quite absorbent? And so the reflection coefficient for rough land could be close to zero, for a smooth ocean, it could be one. It also depends on the polarization of the radiation going out and on the frequency. Now, um, if you have a smooth ocean, there's going to be a change in phase at the reflection. So there'll be a 180 degree shift of the beam as it reflects off the ocean. And so this, um, this capital gamma, uh, the reflection coefficient would be minus one at that point on a very smooth surface like the ocean. So the relative phase that we want to look at between the direct path and the, and the uh, multipath is dependent upon uh, the path length difference and the phase shift on reflection. And in turn, that these are dependent on the geometry, which are the height, the range, and also the frequency of the radar, which will tell us how many wavelengths are different between one and another. Okay. Now what's going to happen is that there's going to be a set of times when the two paths, the direct path and the multipath, will interfere constructively and destructively. And as you look at the, uh, the angle of the multipath beam as it goes down. As it goes down, you go through the minima and maxima. And so this multipath effect, the addition of the direct path and the multipath, causes the elevation coverage to break into what we call a lobed st structure. There'll be uh, a elevation angles where we'll have greatly enhanced detection performance and reduced reflection to put. Um, uh, reduced detection performance. A target located at the maximum out here, since the um, since the the difference in the two paths is, can be 16 times. You're over a smooth ocean. Uh, that that distance, that amp, the uh, power difference taken into account both the way out and the way back can be 16 times difference, which would exactly double the range. So here is a line of target altitude as a function of range. If there was zero reflectivity, zero uh, reflection of the multipath, and that would be the normal range of the radar. And it can double 
if we have multipath that's very strong with a very smooth surface. Uh, in between, if we have uh, some a reflection coefficient that's moderate, say 0.3, uh, which would be a slightly rough ocean or a medium rough ocean, something like that, then you'll get reduced range, but these minima won't go to zero. They'll go the de detection range will go down, but not to zero. Okay, so you can detect farther and less. Okay. Now let's look at what happens when we change the frequency. If we just change the frequency, the, the path length difference will be double if we double the frequency because there'll be two whole cycles in that same path length. And that would mean we'll go through a minimum and a maximum twice. And so we'll have two lobes at double the frequency and the same elevation coverage where we would have one at, say, the first frequency. And again, if we halved the frequency, our lowest lobe would be between the first and second one here. So notice one um, performance issue that comes up. If we're very interested in detecting low altitude aircraft, the bottom of our detection beam is going to go up and we're going to have poorer coverage when we go to lower frequencies. But we'll have more lobes. An interesting exercise for the student would be to look and to see for the geometry as we had before, say uh, an aircraft at 500 feet above flat sea level and a radar at 100 feet and you were dealing with a range to the radar of say 10 nautical miles. Say if I were dealing, if I were at X-band, uh, 10 gigahertz, 3 centimeters, uh, how much frequency shift would I have to give to go from a minima to a maxima? In other words, as I was operating the radar, could I go from one frequency to another to fill in these lobes and still get pretty good low elevation coverage. It's a good student. If there are any students in the audience that have some science or engin electrical engineering background, that's a, good that's a good exercise for you to do. But the main point is that the lobing density increases with increasing radar frequency. Now let's look at over the horizon diffraction. First I want to go over the whole concept of diffraction of waves. Now there are a couple of different, um, if physically intuitive, uh, the mathematics can get a little gory at times, but I w it, there are physically intuitive examples that one can give to show you that. Uh, the first one is this set of three photographs. They're time-lapse photographs of a simulation of a tsunami wave. And this area in the greenish-brown is the land, and of course the bluish area is the ocean, and, and these scientists at the NOAA have simulated coming in from the left a tsunami uh, that's about to strike this peninsula. And in the center you can see the tsunami wave is, interfer is interacting with the peninsula. Some of the energy is reflected back and some forward. And then after a little time later you notice that waves have bent around the peninsula and are coming into the land the ocean wave diffracted around the, the land. So these waves don't just move in a strict line of sight. We're used intuitively with our eyes to very, very short wavelengths, and it was so-called geometrical optics, very short wavelengths, and the light as we see it, at the wavelengths we see it, doesn't go around corners. It just goes in straight lines. And, and at the distances we're normally looking at with our eyes and, the, and the, uh, the sizes of edges, we don't see that diffraction. It's not obvious to us in our intuitive way of looking at things. Another simple example, and I was thinking, say you were in a, a lecture hall, and you were near the back of the lecture hall, and you looked directly at the lecturer. You can hear the lecturer quite well, and you can see the lecturer. Now you back up to the doorway, and the door is wide open. It's a big set of double doors. You're in the doorway. You look at the lecturer, and you can see the lecturer. 
Now you'd back up five or six steps beyond the doorway, and you can still hear the lecturer. Now if you move to the side so that the wall is in your way of the doorway, you know, you're not in the doorway so you can see them, see the lecturer, but you've moved just sideways, you hear the lecturer, but diminished. So those sound waves are traveling around so that you hear them. That's an example of diffraction. Um, there are two other excellent examples for copyright reasons. I couldn't put them on this open website. But if you go to these two URLs, you'll see two beautiful examples of water waves uh, coming into a breakwater and diffracting around it, and water waves coming in to a, uh, a landmass and clearly diffracting around the landmass. Actual photographs of water waves. So the ability in, 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 uh, in the final bottom line, the um, ability of radar to propagate beyond the horizon, I want to point out, it depends upon the frequency of the radiation. The low, it turns out the lower the frequency, the easier it is to propagate around. And upon the height of the radar, so that you have better line of, better, better line of sight over the particular obstacle, whether it's a tall hill, a mountain, or the normal horizon of a regular flat earth. Now let's look at some geometry to put that into perspective what we're looking at. The area that we talked about on a curved earth between the radar and the uh, tangent ray to the horizon, between what we call the line of sight path from here to the horizon, we call that the interference region, all this area. And that's because we can have a direct path going up to a target. And it's, it's the area above the line of sight. Okay, We can have a target up here, too, and it can bounce back down for the multipath and go straight. But the area below that tangent ray, from the radar to the line of sight, we call the diffraction region. And detect signals below that detect de diffraction region, within that re diffraction region, are severely attenuated. But there is some de uh, detection. Later on, when we have a lecture on uh, radar cross-section issues, there are some simulations of electromagnetic waves coming over a barrier. And there's a beautiful simulation of how the electromagnetic wave bends around a barrier. And I'll point that out to you in the in that lecture also. Okay, now we're going to look at the effects of diffraction and multipath and how they depend on radar frequency selection. Uh, here we have a radar that's at a hundred foot altitude and here is the uh, 100 foot altitude following the curved earth at 60 kilometers. And we're looking at an L band radar. Here we see the lowest multipath lobe we've plotted at L band, and the lowest multipath lobe is plotted also at X band. Out at 60 kilometers, the loss is 60 dB, diffraction loss because we're below the horizon at L band, and the loss is 80 dB at X band. Okay, So you can see from a diffraction point of view, it says you'd rather be at L band. But if we look above the geometric horizon where the aircraft would be, uh, the X band lower beam has better low altitude coverage. So we note that a low altitude multipath detection favors the higher frequency X band over the lower frequency. But for diffraction detection below the geometric horizon it favors lower frequencies like L band, but it's tough at any frequency because those are very significant losses that the radar would occur. Now on to atmospheric refraction effects. Refraction is that principle where the uh, physical principle where 
when there's a, a change in the index of refraction of the medium, the, uh, a, a, an electromagnetic wave, and in our case, microwave radiation, which is electromagnetic radiation, uh, it's, it's when the radar beam passes through a medium where there's a changing index of refraction, then the radar beam will bend. Now, I just said the word index of refraction. And the index of refraction is the ratio of the speed of the electromagnetic wave in a vacuum to the speed of the electromagnetic wave in the medium. Now, what does that index of refraction depend upon? It depends upon the temperature of the atmosphere, the pressure of the atmosphere, and the partial pressure of the water in the atmosphere. And that index of refraction drops off with altitude. It drops off exponentially in a mathematical sense. The index of refraction at the Earth's surface is very close to the vacuum, but it's that in the vacuum, but it's not. It's 1.000350. 350 parts per million away from just being what the index of refraction would be in uh, a vacuum. Okay, But that 350 parts per million, which we call that the number of parts per million, we call the refractivity. And that that drops off in a normal atmosphere about 40 parts per million, sometimes as low as 25, sometimes as high as 75 for a normal atmosphere, that many parts per million per kilometer of height. Okay, And we call it uh, super refraction, that's a lot more bending if it drops off, oh, say, 100 parts per million. If it's over 160 parts per million that it drops off per kilometer, we call that super refraction. And we'll see shortly, then the beam can bend a lot, an awful lot. Now let's look at this um, this view graph in two parts to understand refraction. Just refresh your mind. Here we have two pens uh, in glasses. The one on the right, the glass is empty. So between the pen and the camera, so to speak, your eye, uh, there's just a thin layer of glass which doesn't take into pen, doesn't do anything. Uh, it's hard to see the effect, but there is a slight effect. So there's there's no really big chunk with a different index of refraction than air. You see the pen, and the light moves from the pen to your eye or the camera in a straight line. But we fill the glass with water, the uh, light bends at the interface between the water and the outside, the air between you and the glass. And that bending gives rise to an apparent different location of the pen inside the water. And that's, you can visibly see, that's refraction taking place right there. Okay? Now that's between a water-air interface. Now let's look at this view graph above to examine what happens when a radar beam goes through uh, either with or without refraction travels across the Earth. The radar ray in the absence of refraction would move in a straight line. Okay, If the index of refraction were constant with height, just move in a straight line. But since the index of refraction varies with height, the radar beam is bent and the radar horizon is extended further away. So the radar can see f further away than it could if the index of refraction did not change with height. Now let's see what that means in terms of how we do calculations and things. Now you could see from the previous view graph that the f distance you can see depends on how curved the Earth is. Okay. Now, if the radius of the Earth were greater, you could see farther. So, but what we can do is to 
account for the refraction by replacing the Earth in our geometrical calculations, replacing the radius of the Earth, A, in those calculations by an equivalent Earth radius, Ka, and then assume straight line propagation. So here we have an antenna beam bent due to refraction by the Earth's atmosphere, radius A, and the shape of the beam in an equivalent Earth represented with a radius Ka. Okay, and it will give you the same results for the radar horizon. Typical value for K for a normal atmosphere is four-thirds. And we refer to that as four-thirds Earth propagation. Okay. Now, with that four-thirds Earth propagation, the normal atmosphere, we have uh, the radar beam going in a straight line, propagating in a straight line. Um, if we have less of a decrease in refractivity than that typical 40 parts per million per kilometer, we call that subrefraction, and that limits the radar horizon. But if we have more than that, we call it superrefraction. And then we can have an effect if we, it goes up to 160 parts per million per kilometer for the decrease in refractivity, then we call that ducting. And that effectively has the radar beam trapped, going at a very, you know, it, it, um, it just, just to follow the, uh, the Earth's horizon is only limited by the attenuation of the uh, beam. Now, what's the effect of ducting on target detection? With no surface duct, uh, the radar would have a number of multipath lobes, and we have two targets that are heading towards this radar, and we see with no surface duct that this aircraft would be detected by the low beam, and this lower aircraft wouldn't be seen till it was much closer into the radar. If we have a surface duct, that lowest beam would be bent down, and the lower beam would be detected, and the upper aircraft, excuse me, and the upper aircraft would be uh, not detected till much further in. There'd be effectively a hole in the coverage. So you can see that ducting can extend the low altitude detection, but can also cause unexpected holes in the radar coverage. Now here is a plane position indicator a display of detections above the minimum detectable signal of a radar located in the vicinity of Boston, Massachusetts. You can see in dark solid lines the outlines of the states. Here's Cape Cod, Rhode Island, the eastern part of Connecticut, New Hampshire up here, and, and Maine. And typically under normal atmospheric propagation, you just see a little bit of ground clutter around the Boston area. You might see a little bit about the hills around Worcester, Massachusetts, in central Massachusetts, but not much else. You would not see any detections from Cape Cod, which is, uh, you know, 50 to 100 feet above sea level at the most, out at, at 100 kilometers. You just wouldn't see it. But here you notice it very nicely. You have a lot of detections in Cape Cod. You even have detections up in, in Maine. No way would you see that in a normal atmospheric conditions. And these, uh, co these uh, the colorations are uh, in units of dBZ, which are, uh, uh, are used for uh, weather radars to denote intensity of backscatter, of volumetric clutter, actually, but they also show up uh, ground clutter. And uh, so what this shows you, I'll mean, just point out these are 50 kilometer uh, range rigs. So we're seeing, you know, clearly uh, in a relatively flat area, uh, ground clutter uh, over 50, 60 miles, and that's really unheard of in the New England area that you'd see ground clutter uh, this over this such, such a great area. So ducting conditions can extend to extreme ranges of the horizon. It's the message I'd like to leave you with. So now in f uh, to finish the lecture, Summarize, we've gone over in the lecture atmospheric attenuation and all the different uh, effects that come into play. Uh, Multipath reflection and interference, multipath. We've looked at diffraction, the trade-offs in multipath and diffraction at different frequencies. 
We looked at refraction, bending of radar beams in the atmosphere, and how under different atmospheric conditions the bending can be slight or extreme and what those effects would be on a radar. And here are the references, and shortly we'll move on to the next lecture.